Amen. Today is a very special day here at Thrive Church. We are actually taking a break from the series we're doing here at Thrive on the book of Acts to focus today on a very important topic. It's the topic of mental health. And see, just as you're traveling, and when you're traveling long distances on a plane, sometimes we'll do a stopover somewhere in the middle. Well, you can see this as it says, we're traveling through the book of Acts. Today, en route to our final destination, we're going to make a stopover. And we're going to make, make a stopover to talk about the importance of your mental health. Would you turn to me and say, your mental health is important? Your mental health is important. And guess what? Because your mental health is important, I couldn't think of a better person to help us talk about mental health today. See, Dr. Gloria Lee, she's a registered psychologist. She's the clinical director of Brentwood Counseling Center in Burnaby. She's also served as a professor at University of British Columbia and other universities teaching uh, counseling psychology. Uh, in fact, she's not just someone who counsels people herself, but she actually trains other counselors at the doctorate and postdoctorate level to be better counselors in what, whatever they practice. And see, over the past 24 years, Dr. Gloria Lee, she has counseled countless individuals, couples, uh, you know, families, youth, larger organizations through issues such as depression, anxiety, uh, you know, stress, trauma, grief, you know, anger, marital issues, relationship problems, and so much more. And on top of all that, uh, Dr. Gloria, she actually recently wrote a book called The Kick-Ass Couple. And it's become a, an Amazon bestseller. It's an award-winning book. And frankly, it's one of the best books that Pastor Charlene or I have ever come across when it comes to the topic of relationships. If you are planning to get married, or you're already married, or you just want a healthier perspective on relationships, we highly recommend Dr. Gloria's book called The Kick-Ass Couple. Uh, Dr. Lee has been a pastor as well at the church. And so, you know, an extremely accomplished woman. Dr. Gloria Lee could not do most of uh, all these things if it were not for the incredible support of her extremely capable and timelessly handsome husband. His name is Clark, and he's actually standing in the back right now. You can give him a big hand as well. Let's welcome Clark. You know, if they ever come out with a new Superman movie franchise, I would vote for Clark to be cast as Superman. Uh, he looks like Superman, and he, his, his name even fits the bill. And so we're really glad to have both Dr. Gloria and Clark with us today. They're a wonderful team together. They've got three beautiful children, and we could not be more blessed. And you know, on top of that, all of that is that, uh, let me just tell you something, is when I was a teenager, I was going to a little church youth group. Uh, Dr. Gloria was my uh, youth group counselor. Uh, who was leading that youth group. And so if you want to know any or all of my secrets about when I was, you know, 19 and younger than that, then feel free to ask Dr. Lee. She might not say anything, but she knows a lot of what I've gone through. I'm so blessed to have such an excellent friend like Dr. Gloria in my life, and I know you're going to be so blessed by what she shares today. And so would you please join me in welcoming here to Thrive Church, Dr. Gloria Lee, as she brings the message to us today. Let's give her a big hand. Hello, good morning. Thank you, JB, for that uh, wonderful welcome. I, we were just talking in the back earlier, and you guys get to hear this. The other service did it. Um, we're reminiscing about uh, when he got baptized, he, he actually wore his, um, what, what is it called, S uh, snorkeling gear <laughs> in the, in the uh, dunking tank. So I thought that was, he was like grade nine, you said? Grade nine, so... Yeah, that's how I remember him, this little punk, but anyway. <laughs> um, anyhow, it's good to be back. Um, it's much better live, in person. I get to see your faces, and I see how you look. It's, it's awesome, and much better than looking through a screen, hoping someone would be on the other side. And when JB asked me to come back to speak to you, I was praying to God what your church needed to hear today. And as I was praying... This theme came to mind, living your best life. So living your best life, what does it mean? Let me start by telling you a little story about myself to explain what I mean. So when I was a kid, I uh, probably between the ages of um, 8 to about 16, I love reading the local paper that came weekly. So I would get it, and then I would turn to two sections. The first one was the one in the middle, 
the flyers. So I would take the flyers and look at all the deals and clip out all the coupons. I, I don't know why I did that. I mean, I was a kid, but I think it's the Asian in me that just really liked the good deal. And the second part, I would flip to the back and I would read the obituaries. So the obituaries is a place where they have little write-ups of people who just passed away. So there were like small write-ups, medium length ones, and these big long ones. I would read through each one of them and the short one sounded something like this. So John Doe was born on this day and he passed away on this day. He worked here, he went to school there and he leaves behind two kids, the end. And the longer ones would sound something like, Jane Doe was a beloved mother, daughter, sister, wife, colleague, friend. Everywhere she went, she touched the lives of others. She gave so generously. She was kind, caring, and she served others well. She's dearly missed by all who knew her. The world is a better place today because she was here. And I thought to myself, Jane Doe lived her best life. Um, can you flip the slide? Thank you. So, fast forward three months ago to this day on May 14th, I was in Calgary on a small uh, weekend trip with my husband, Clark, and it was a Saturday evening, and I got this call from my pastor. And my pastor never calls unless it's something really important or something really bad. So when the phone rang, I braced myself, and then I didn't get it, and then he called again, and I thought, okay, this must be really important. So I answered the phone, and he said to me, Gloria, I have bad news. Olivia was in a scuba diving accident, and she drowned. Will you speak to our church tomorrow and navigate us through this? So my heart just sank. I flew back from uh, Calgary to Vancouver. It was a one-hour flight, and during that flight, I opened up my laptop, started preparing my notes for the next morning to speak to my church. I, I was in such disbelief, and I was utterly shattered by the news. And as I was preparing my notes, I was like bawling my eyes out. And I'm sure the person sitting beside me was like, what's going on with her? Um, so Olivia. Olivia was 45 when she passed away. She was married to my friend Solomon for about 20 years. And by the way, Saul gave me permission to talk about this today. Olivia was a mother of three beautiful girls. She was a stay-at-home mom, so she took care of these kids. They know her well. They miss her dearly. She's the youngest of four children in her family. Her parents and her family lived across the street from my house, actually, for many years. And so I've known her family for about 30 years. And her family would tell me how much they miss her, her goofiness, her, she was always very bubbly, kind. She would make the family laugh. She was the person that people went to uh, when they felt bad. She took care of her elderly parents when they got sick. And when her older sister got cancer, she was the one who showed up and took care of her. She was that kind of person. And at our church, Olivia served as the woman's ministry leader. She was the one who would organize all the church retreats for the women. She was the one who did the tea parties, hiking trips, book clubs, uh, other fun activities. And when someone was sick at our church, like the woman who had cancer, 
she would be the one who would organize food chains so the family would not be without. She was that kind of person. She was our Jane Doe, and she lived her best life. In my profession, um, I always ask myself, what, what gift of legacy does this person leave behind to me anytime someone passes away that I love? And this is hard. I know some of you probably have loved ones who passed on as well. So I ask myself, what gift of legacy do they leave for me? What lesson do they teach me? With Olivia, her legacy to me is how to serve others lavishly. For Clark, my husband, who's also known her for 30 years, it was about sacrifice and loyalty, how she moved up to Dee's Lake, which is a boonie town uh, in BC, and she went there because her husband got a job there. She didn't want to be there, but that was her. She would serve. When I asked Saul what stood out for him, and of course, you know, she was so loving, kind, generous, how do you pick? But he said the one thing that stood out beyond anything else is her ability to forgive, to forgive others. No matter what people did, she was able to let it go and forgive them. And so the day after she passed away, Saul went to his father, whom he hasn't spoken to for several years because they've been estranged. And he forgave him. And they reconciled. I've had over 25 years, or almost 25 years, I should say, walking with different people during their last days of life and their family members, and some of, them, some of the family members after their loved one passed away. And it's some of the most meaningful work I've ever done. They often want to work out the relationships that's been um, conflictual or estranged, and they want to find peace before they pass. Oftentimes, regrets will come out, and they'll talk about things that they wish they had done but never did. Um, keeping in touch with certain people, or saying how they felt about someone and telling them how much they cared or loved them. There are all these regrets that came to mind. And it reminded me of this book that um, Bronnie Rare, she wrote, she's a palliative care nurse who interviewed thousands of patients who were terminal. This book is called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And here's what she found. The top regret, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. Two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Three, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. And four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And five, I wish I had let myself be happier. And this very much echoes what I've seen over the years. And when we look at these top five regrets, I think of the themes, the main themes that come to mind. And here they are, the first one, not being authentic to yourself. We're not living our best life. We're not living out our calling. Why? Because of fear of judgment, fear of failure, fear of rejection. We hold back from saying to the people who we love how we feel about them. We hold back from truly being who we are called to be because we don't want someone to say, who do you think you are? Or you're not good enough. And so what happens instead is we have these mistaken ambitions. We work harder. We strive for success, money, accolades, all these toys, and being busy. 
being busy. We, we wear that like a badge of honor, that the busier we are, the more successful we are, or something like that. And it doesn't matter if you're working full time, 40, 80 hours a week, or you're a stay at home mom or dad, busyness, striving, mistaken ambitions. So I think Steve Jobs says it best in his 2005 Stanford commencement speech. And this is part of his speech. He says this, remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you're going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven doesn't want to die to get there. And yet, death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it, and that is as it should be. Because death is the very likely the single best invention of life. It is life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, you are the new. But someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become and everything else is secondary. And it makes me think about the church in, in the book of Acts, the early church. You know, when you look at the context, they were the trailblazers and the pioneers of our church today. They had no one to follow. They were the first. And that's pretty scary. I can imagine their friends, their family, their colleagues, saying to them, what are, you th what are you thinking? What are you doing? Are you crazy? Or uh, who do you think you are? And who, who's this Jesus guy? Don't, don't wreck your life. Don't do this. But nevertheless, the people of the early church, our forefathers and our foremothers, they followed their heart and their intuition. They had the courage to leave the old behind and the faith to believe in the new. But they had to cling on to each other and to Christ, to the hope of Christ. Why? Because they knew they couldn't do it alone. None of us can. And most of all, they allowed the Holy Spirit to lead and guide them. Because honestly, humanly speaking, we can't do it. We can't do it. And I think about your church today, Thrive Church. When I first met JB, he was this little young pipsqueak. And, you know, his, I think the expectations that uh, the family might have had for him was to maybe become a lawyer and have a different outcome. But he had the courage and the faith to live out his best life, along with Shar. And so here we are today. Why all of us are here today. And so church, I think about the, the, the passage that most stands out to me in Acts that talks about courage and faith. Acts 4, 13 to 14. This is right after Peter and John 
healed the crippled man that was sitting in front of the temple for like 40 years. Everybody knew who this man was. They kind of passed by him every day, ignoring him. But they knew that he was a crippled man. And so Peter and John, in faith, with the power of Jesus, with the Holy Spirit in them, they, would, they healed this man, told this man to stand. And this man did. And everybody saw what was happening, and they were amazed. And so Acts says here, when they, the people, saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these two men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So the courage of Peter, John, and the early church. They're ordinary folk like you and I. But they looked to Jesus to follow and to have faith and to each other. And because of that power that they relied on, they did really amazing, miraculous things. And therefore, the people who witnessed, they had nothing to say. The facts are right there. The man was healed. So, Thrive Church, here we are today. The church today. This is the challenge for us then. To know who you are in Christ and that you are truly worthy of love and joy. To know your calling and to have faith to live it out. Because love drives out all fear. So have the courage to lo love well daily. And above all, remember the sacredness of time. We don't know when our time is up. So live your best life today. And so I leave you with this. At the end of your life, the only thing you leave on earth is your legacy. And the only thing you take to heaven is your story. Let me say it again. At the end of your life, the only thing you leave on earth is your legacy. And the only thing you take to heaven is your story. Olivia's legacy was serving others lavishly, sacrificing and being loyal, forgiveness, kindness, generosity, amongst other things that I don't even know about. And I'm sure she's in heaven today with God. And they're talking about, remember the time at the woman's retreat when all these women came together and they reconciled and there was a time of healing. And God would say, yeah, well done. I remember that. Olivia lived her best life. So church, what will your legacy be? What will your story be? May you have the courage to live your best life today. Amen. Can we give Dr. Glory a big hand? I want to thank Dr. Gloria for a powerful, powerful message. And, you know, I find it really interesting talking about death. It's not something that we often like to talk about, especially if you lost someone you love recently or a long time ago. It still hurts, I'm sure. You can't really get over it fully. And it's one of those things where death kind of sucks that way, is that, you know, death separates, death causes pain. And it's an interesting take. It's an interesting perspective that we're hearing today, you know, from Dr. Gloria and, you know, even the Steve Jobs address about how death actually, there's some good things that happen through death. Is that, you know, it clears out the old, it brings in the new, it simplifies, it clarifies, it reminds us of what's most important in life. And 
even so sometimes we're kind of scared of it. And, and maybe you're here today and, and that's actually the thing you're terrified of. And I gotta admit that for a lot of us, you know, even for people who've been Christians for a really long time, sometimes we think of death as like a really bad thing. It's an awful thing. It's like the thing you want to avoid at all costs. And it's true. Death is the result of sin. God is life. When we had separated ourselves from God by our sin, our choices, doing things our way, not God's way, we separate ourselves from the life that is in God. And so the Bible says the result of that is death, not even just physical death, but eternal death, separation from God, since we can't get to where God is because God is life. And the, the thing is this, sometimes we think of, you know, oh, death is such a bad thing and all that, but I'm here to let you know is that to conquer death, God sent Jesus Christ, not only to die on the cross for our sins, but to rise again from the grave, to show that death and sin have no hold over him. And if you place your trust in Jesus, death and sin don't have to have any hold on you for eternity. If you believe that, say amen. And see, that's the hope we have in Jesus. It's because he conquered the grave. And so nowadays, whether you might, whether you, you, know, whereas you might say, oh yeah, death is you know, Satan's weapon. It's, 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 you know, it's the sting of death, all that stuff. The fact is, if you read Revelation chapter one, verse 20, it says that Jesus says himself, I hold the keys of death. So in other words, God holds in his hand life and death. And that's why at the end of your life, you know, you might have a gravestone where your remains are placed, whether you're cremated or you're buried or something else happens to you. And there will be on that gravestone two dates, the date of your birth, the date of your death. And you have no control over the date of your birth. You've got almost no control over the date of your death. But what you do have control over is that little hyphen in between and how you're gonna live this life. And I'm so thankful for Dr. Glory's message today to tell, say live your best life. Don't hold back. Don't be controlled by fear. Be everything that God made you to be because Jesus Christ has conquered the grave and he holds the keys of life and death in his hands such that even on that very last day, it can be a blessing because you don't leave home, you go home. And that death day can be a blessing because God uses even death for a greater story. That's the, that's, that's the gospel. That's Jesus. That's the death of, that's his death on the cross. There is resurrection. There's hope after the grave. If you believe that, would you give God some praise in this place together right now? And so with that in mind, we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask everyone just to stand as we respond to God. And if you don't mind, as part of our little stopover, on mental health today. I thought I'd share a song, a new song with all of you today with the help of the band. Some of you guys know the song already. I encourage you to sing it along. It's a very simple song, but let's use this as our opportunity to draw near to the God who holds life and death in his hands. And we're just gonna draw into God and make this our time to be with him right now. Hold me close, don't ever let me go. Jesus, how I need you more than I can know. Take me to where I can see your face. Cause nothing can compare to your embrace when I'm here with you. When I'm here with you Sing, come to me Come to me All who are weary Lay down all the weight you're feeling I will give the rest you're needing Bring to me All of your worry Every hurt and each frustration Find your rest in me Jesus, you are greater than my circumstance Nothing can compare to your greatness You alone are worthy of our worship, God So be praised God be praised Don't ever let 
me go Jesus how I need you more than I can know take me to where I can see your face cause nothing can compare to your embrace when I'm here Come to me, all who are with me, lay down all the ways you're feeling, I will give the rest you need, bring to me, all of your worry, every hurt and each frustration, find your rest in me. Jesus, you are greater than all circumstance. Nothing can compare to your great day. You alone are worthy of our worship, Lord. So be praised. God, be praised. Lift your name. Lift your name. Just lift your hands to God right now. Let the height of your hands reflect how much you need Him today. And we're going to do this right now as we're going to respond to God in prayer. And today we're talking today about how God, He's the God of life and death. And because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and He also rose again from the grave, that when we place our trust in Jesus, we don't need to be controlled by a fear of death anymore. That we can even see death 
when it comes as a blessing in God's time, because God uses death for the purpose that is bigger than our plan sometimes. He's bigger than it all. And if you're here and you want to have hope after death, Maybe you find that you're scared of death. Maybe you find that there's not a lot of hope after death. And I'm here to let you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And he rose again from the grave. So you could have a hope that is stronger than death. And if you want to be forgiven of your sins today, if you want forgiveness for stuff that maybe you said last week or stuff that you did last night, or you're just not really sure if you're forgiven of your sins today, I'm here to let you know God made a way when we couldn't get to him ourselves. He sent Jesus Christ for you and for me. And it's as simple as opening up your heart to Jesus, asking him to be your savior, to forgive your sins. If that's something you need to do today, we want to lead you in a simple prayer to pray for God's forgiveness today. If that's you and you need that, why don't you lift your hand to God right now. Let the height of hands reflect how much you want God's forgiveness, how much you're just coming to God honestly today, just as you are, real with Him. And if you're online, you can feel free to click a link in your chat room or scan the QR code on your screen. It's going to take you to a prayer that we're going to pray together. If you're here and you need to pray that prayer, one of our team on site will also give you a little card with that prayer on it. And this is our simple way to humble ourselves before God and ask God to forgive us of our sins, not because of how good we are, but simply because Jesus Christ, the one perfect one, shed his blood on the cross to make forgiveness and a relationship with God possible once again. And so if that's you and you need to pray that prayer, why don't you pray that prayer with me right now? Just repeat this after me. In fact, why don't you pray this prayer with all those who are praying for the first time right now, church? Let's pray this together. We're going to say, Dear Jesus, Jesus, thank you you. that because you love me, you you died on the cross cross to pay for my sins. sins. You rose again again to give me life. life. Today, Today, I open up my heart and I ask you, please forgive me of all my sins and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I place my trust not in what I do, but in what you've done for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you give God some praise in this place? Would you give God a hand? Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant that prayer, then the Bible says you are forgiven of your sins. And just like we've been talking about in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up in front of a big crowd who's just received Jesus Christ in their lives. He says, believe and be baptized. And if you prayed that prayer just now, you've done the first part. You believe in Jesus Christ. Praise God. We encourage you to take that next step, that second step. Believe and be baptized. We encourage you to get baptized. Baptism is not a graduation. It's not you saying, look how good I am, or I'm such an experienced person, or, you know, I'm so committed to Jesus. Baptism is you saying, I thank Jesus for dying on the cross for me, for rising again from the grave. And because of him, I have hope. That's what baptism is about. It's not a graduation. It's a beginning. It's your next step after receiving Jesus Christ into your life. If you prayed that prayer just now, go to mythgod.info for uh, just more info on baptism. Press the baptism button there. Now, Hello everyone! Welcome to Thrive Church. My name is Kathy and it's so great to be here with you guys today. Before I let you guys go, I have a few announcements for you. If it's your first time here, we would love to get to know you better, so please text NEW to 604-285-5770 or visit MyThrive.info and we'll mail you your very own Thrive Stainless Steel water bottle. If you're on site at Lee Pond Place, you can pick one up by the Welcome Center by the exit door after service. It's time to get outdoors and enjoy the sunshine, beach, playground, and activities for adults and children. Join us for the Thrive Summer Picnic at Centennial Beach on Saturday, September 3rd at 2 p.m. Bring your own picnic mat and food. Rain or shine ice cream will be served at 3 p.m. First come, first serve. Last but not least, if you're not currently part of a small group of Thrive, we highly encourage you to join one. This is the best way to meet new friends, pray, support, and to have fun with one another. To sign up, please visit mythrive.info. That's it for this week. I hope you all have a great day. Don't forget to give your tithes and offerings online at mythrive.info. Have an amazing Sunday afternoon, and I'll see you all next week online or on site at Lee Pond Place. Bye!